Hello and welcome to Design Education Talk from the New Art School. Our guest today is Martin Salisbury. Welcome, Martin. Hi, Letharis. Um, thanks for inviting me. Good, good to be here. It's great to have you here. So tell us about you and your work. Right. Well, I am a professor of illustration at Cambridge School of Art, which is part of um, uh, Anglia Ruskin University, but the art school goes back to uh, 1858, and uh, it's one of many provincial art schools that are now part of bigger universities, of course. Um, cut a long story short, background, I was born up on the borders of North Wales and England near Chester, uh, but my family moved down to the south to Cambridge uh, when I was quite small, so I grew up, grew up mostly in Cambridge. I went to a boys' grammar school. Um, Funnily enough, I was listening to your podcast with Cal Swan, I think it was, who was talking about the joys of boys' grammar schools. Um, and um, there was very little uh, focus on art and design there. I, had a, I did have a lovely art uh, teacher called Richard Sell, who was a meticulous lithographer. Um, but you could tell he hated the job of <laughs> teaching students who didn't want to... Um, didn't really want to be taught art and design. So I had always loved drawing and um, especially nature, you know, drawing animals, birds, and, and those two things coming together. And the only things I was any good at at grammar school were um, art and English. Um, so I applied to art school. I only discovered that there was a thing called art school uh, right, right at the end of sixth form. Because of course, all the careers advisors, careers teachers, um, you know, if you were very, if you were bright, you went to university. If you were not quite so bright, you went to a teacher training college. Uh, but nobody mentioned art school. And um, when I said to him, I, I think I'd like to go to art school. I've just heard about it, and he was absolutely horrified and said, "Yeah, well, you don't want a job then." Um, so anyway, I went to the local Cambridge School of Arts to do a two-year foundation course and. It was just like landing in heaven, you know. I mean, everybody you draw all day, you know. <laughs> it was just wonderful. So from there, I applied to what was then a diploma in art and design, a three-year course in the 1970s. And I went to Maidstone College of Art, another provincial art school, with a very strong tradition, um, a lot of very well-known illustrators came out of there, actually. And I was, my course leader there was Gerald Rose. Well, actually, in those days, you, you started off only by doing graphic design. I think there were no um, courses, uh, named courses in illustration. So you, if you wanted to do illustration, you would do it within graphic design. But during the three years, uh, Gerald Rose... Um, who's a wonderful children's book illustrator, um, separated the two so that you could specialise in illustration. So, And also during that time, it was the time that Diploma in Art and Design courses were given degree awarding status. So it became a, a BA honours just uh, towards the end of the course. I, I recall lo suddenly lots of um, bearded men running around telling us we had to write essays because we were now doing a degree. So that was my education. I didn't know much about how you made a living as an illustrator, but I left and got work very quickly um, and worked as a freelance illustrator for many, many years. I mean, I guess 15 or 20 years before I started doing a bit of part-time teaching. But the work I was doing was mostly in non-fiction, in those days, non-fiction books for children, um, illustration was really very, mostly very realist in those days. Um, the the only other trend really was the arrival of the so-called um, radicals at the Royal College of Art, who were kind of coinciding with the punk generation and were, there were some very interesting artists, but uh, some of them lasted the test of time and quite a few didn't um, so 
Shall I carry on? <laughs> yes, please. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. So I got asked to come in and do the odd day of teaching at Cambridge School of Art and one or two other places. Um, but I was determined, you know, not to be sucked into the world of uh, education too much and keep it at arm's length. I did get asked to take a fractional post and I, I said no. Um, but I enjoyed the teaching a lot um, and found it, it helped me. You know, I, I was learning as much as hopefully the students were. Um, and then the course leader for the, the BA in illustration at Cambridge um, got sick and uh, I was asked if I could take it over and I took a 0.5 post and um, I was always bemused as to why there was so little attention given to children's book illustration um, on undergraduate illustration courses it was really regarded as the lowest of the low you know sort of cozy corner of bunny drawing um but you know when there was so much uh interesting work going on there and also i suppose my theory was that perhaps that was because all of the children's book illustrators were very busy work-wise and all of the editorial illustrators were in need of a bit of teaching <laughs> to make ends meet so it, it somehow became so focused on editorial work but um I tried to encourage a bit more interest in children's book illustration, and we did have several students who, at that time, who were already naturally interested and who won some major competitions. And that side of it grew over time. And then while we were on a, a drawing trip to um, Budapest, uh, I used to take the students on field trips drawing at the beginning of the second year. Well, we we went to Portugal and Seville and Budapest, but um, I was with Leo Duff, uh, who was um, teaching at Kingston at the time, who was our guest speaker, a guest uh, illustrator on the trip. And we were talking about master's courses, and uh, she said, well, why don't you design an MA in children's book illustration? So it was her idea. Um, I thought, yeah, why not? And so I did and took it through validation. Um, the validators within the university culture that was very, again, sort of led from the humanities side were sort of openly contemptuous of the idea of an MA in children's book illustration. And I thought maybe we would have a dozen students a year, something like that. Um, but it was incredible. I mean, it was the first one uh, in the world, I think, um, a master's course, and it obviously struck a chord. And before very long, we were flooded with applications, uh, and, and I was still 0.5 then, running both courses. Nearly killed me. Um, so in the end, I went full time. Um, and for 18 years or so, I led the course. It grew to I think something like 180 students now, but I've um, stepped down to 0.5 again. And um, my successor, Shelley Jackson, is doing a fantastic job um, since she took over. And I'm still teaching on the course. I love the teaching. And um, oh, and I've been writing books, basically. So if I just rewind for a moment back to the very early days of the MA in 2000. And or I think it was, I got asked to write a book about children's book illustration by Quarto Publishing, the book packager. And I'd always been interested in writing, and I thought, yep, why not? Um, but I was doing this all in my, really in the summer holidays, the writing. That did very well. Um, and later, I mean, sometime later, I approached Lawrence King Publishing, the design publishers, who's since been taken over by Hachette. And I did a couple of books with them. I collaborated with Morag Stiles here, who was professor of children's literature at Cambridge University. We did a book together. And since then, I've been writing books regularly. Phew. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> oh, you seem to have answered many questions. So you, you, you've actually been, uh, you've seen a lot of uh, changes in, in the world of education. 
Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I, you know, from being a student, um, the, the traditional uh, kind of provincial art schools um, and seeing them swallowed up by the um, polytechnics and then the polytechnics becoming universities. And I mean, a lot of my time as course leader for undergraduate and then for the MA, I have to confess, has take, been taken up by fighting battles against the institutional culture, which I'm sure many other course leaders around the country would understand. And um, I suppose if I'm honest, I personally still feel that art schools don't fit in universities as they are now. It, it still seems to be a very uncomfortable connection. And it's it's so exhausting for the staff of uh, schools of art. And it's good to see an interest in the hi history of the, the schools of art um, building. I mean, I've long wanted to write uh, something about the history of the traditional art schools and art and design education. But I see there's a, a group um, called the Art School Project, yes. uh, I think, who are kind of photographing all the buildings that still stand. And, uh, and it's really great to see that. And I, I hope that builds further. So what do you see as the challenges for today's aspiring illustrators in this environment, starting, starting from education, of course? Yeah, um, there are many. I mean, I can only speak from my own experience. Uh, I mean, I should say that as our master's course um, gained in reputation and, and uh, the fact that I, I was writing books that were published in many different countries um, gave it a lot more visibility, I think. You know, it says um, author Martin Salisbury is course leader for MA in Children's Book Illustration at Cambridge School of Art. So that's how a lot of international students found their way to us. And we have students from so many countries. Um, being cynical about it, I think that then made a, a big difference to the university's attitude to the course. So we are probably luckier than a lot of other course leaders around, or courses and course leaders around the country in that we, we, do, we are able to argue from a position of, of strength. Um, so we've been able, in answer to your question, we've been able to retain, I think, more of the traditional approaches to teaching the subject with a, a huge focus on drawing. I mean, this was my, always my absolute um, priority when I designed the course, which, which begins for the, the first sort of 30% um, of the a very specific linear program. It begins with a, a module in drawing, followed by a module in sequential image, sequential design. And we absolutely encourage, we tell the students not to think about children at all at that stage. You know, it's about building up those uh, underpinning skills. And the students, once they get into the rhythm of drawing as a habit, they absolutely, you know, become addicted to drawing. And But I think it's very hard to do that in a lot of places around the country. Uh, it's seen as somehow outmoded, you know, and in my view, that tends to lead to a lot of students taking shortcuts, using purely digital tricks to make illustration that all looks the same. I've done um, some uh, quite a bit of guest teaching at, uh, online at places around the world recently, and I've been slightly alarmed to see the the sort of conveyor belt manga illustration coming out. So you know, we, we say to students, it's it's about what your passions are. It, it's about a combination of building these underlying skills. Yes, have influences, look at a lot of stuff, but we're not going to teach you any tricks or formulae. Um, follow your, your heart. Um, and what's happened, uh, I, I think we, we may have had some, uh, played some role in this, but, but around the world, I would say that children's book illustration has become increasingly authorial, uh, the picture book becoming a thing that is created primarily by an artist. Um, 
students uh, uh, when they come on the course often say well i can't i don't know how to write you know are, are you going to teach me creative writing and we say no not really i mean we, we teach you sequential thinking um and, and they discover they can tell stories visually without being as it were skilled writers you know and the picture book has become such a, an integrated thing that uh there are fewer and fewer good picture book text writers there are still some very good ones but um i think most picture books now evolve as a kind of singular authorial composition um and i think that has elevated the status of the picture book greatly uh, and of the of the illustrator i mean i think perhaps the word illustrator is becoming redundant because strictly speaking it means embellishing you know and augmenting something that already exists in textual form whereas many illustrators now are, are becoming more like film directors really um authors directors set designers you know the full works so it's an exciting time i think fantastic so Again, after the students leave education, what, what do you see as the greatest challenge for them right now? Um, sorry, yes, that was your, your original question. That's fine. Um, the greatest challenge, um, again, I think we're in a slightly luxurious position in that the status of, of the course means that when we have our London graduation show and we also have a, a stand showing student work at the Bologna Children's Book Fair, the publishers flock to to talent spot whereas for most for a lot of graduating students of course around the country they will all have graduation shows and hopefully the good publishers will really look hard around the country um but when i left college you know you used to literally walk around with a big portfolio under your arm and phone up and say would you see me and that, that's how we got work but it's much more competitive now. I mean, that's a big challenge. A lot more people are doing illustration. I would say it's a good idea not to put all your eggs in the picture book basket. I mean, we all love the picture book, but it's pretty saturated at the moment. You know, think about um, nonfiction. We, we have had a, a boom in illustrated nonfiction over the last few years. Big, big nonfiction books. Um, a few years back, all the publishers would say, "Oh, you can't, you can't publish big books. We can't I sell them." Discussion. Then, and then that book Maps came along um, from the Polish couple. I can't remember the name or pronounce the name, but that had a major impact. It was so successful, and then every publisher wanted to publish big nonfiction books. We've had a lot of um, nonfiction biographical picture books. Uh, great figures from history but uh, yeah spread yourself across different types of books have have examples in your portfolio um especially of young adult fiction i, I mean i'm always saying to our students that's a huge area of, of work you know you walk into a bookshop and of course you go straight to the picture books because they're lovely and big and colorful but there are shelves and shelves full of illustrated um young adult or early readers and increasingly in color and increasingly more integrated and and sort of sometimes sort of hybrid picture book um illustrated book and i think in my experience from our ma graduates a lot of the ones who studied graphic design before the master's course um a better place to spread themselves across illustration design and the merging of the two we do have uh, many students who didn't do illustration at undergraduate level and um, some come from fine art fine art refugees we call those um, graphic design but even sometimes from non-art and design areas and, and they can be very interesting too um, that's the, I, the idea of, of skills you know you, you expect Mm. people have, have very strong drawing skills some don't and some that have gone on to be very successful they may not have strong academic drawing you can usually see how they might express themselves um and find a way you know if, if they're absolutely full of ideas and have got some kind of aesthetic sense 
So that's always very rewarding when you see somebody come from a, a completely different background like that and go on to success. That's very interesting. Mm. So you said your latest project is to do with what is related to the to the art schools. No, no, that's that's something that's been kind of um, brewing in the back of my mind for years. I've spoken to my publishers about it. Um, I'm very lucky to work with Thames and Hudson, who are really great to work with. But I think they and others are, are nervous about. You know, all publishers have to do, be confident that the book's going to sell. Um, you know, when you write a proposal for a book, there's a big section on uh, who's the audience, who's going to buy this book. Of course, and I like writing books. I, I, I never like writing academic books. I like writing books for people to buy and read, and books that are um, beautifully designed and um, to be enjoyed in in all sorts of ways. But I've just, in fact, the the art school project who I mentioned earlier um, just posted yesterday that there's an article in the Guardian and Observer about their work and the the sort of lost world of British art schools. So. I think, as I say, that there's something that has just been neglected. I mean, mm. I think people forget that almost every provincial town had this building called the Art College, uh, and a lot of them still exist. Some don't. Some have been absorbed into and used by the the universities and institutions. But their contribution to the, to use the buzz term, uh, creative industries, was uh, massive. You know, and it was a way into education for people who had not got the traditional uh, academic qualifications. I mean, I, I when I got to Maidstone, I, I was surprised to discover most of the other students were a year or two younger than me because they hadn't done a sixth form and um, A-levels, um, but they had got into art school on the basis of their strong portfolio. Um, and of course, now we realize that something like 30% of art students are dyslexic. Um, but in those days, the word for it was not very bright, you know. Um, so it was a wonderful thing. I'm getting all nostalgic now, but. <laughs> um, it, it's a huge issue, the GPA in, uh, in the entrance exams right now. Yeah. I, I, find yeah. that, I find it ridiculous that the requirement for a GPA score automatically excludes students. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very tricky. We, we've made arguments for um, various students who the university have said, no, they're, you know, they're not, not sufficiently qualified and uh, we've managed to, to win some of them. But um, whilst I'm suspicious of the, this term talent, um, it talents the wrong word it suggests a sort of god-given uh, gift sure but um words like perception or or knowledge through making it's a different kind of knowledge and this is something else that i'm reading about and researching a lot more recently you know bruce archer's views at the royal college of art on the traditional ideas of the three r's and as I get more and more nerdily educational, I'm reading um, Herbert Reed's Education Through Art now. Yeah. Um, but there's so much sense in those books. Um, and, you know, arguing that, as Herbert Reed did, that art should be the, the foundation stone of, of education, not, not this thing seen as um, a sort of useless, indulgent add-on. Yeah. Um, but I think we're sort of shouting in the dark somehow we will get there what is your latest project that you're working on uh book wise well i've um uh, uh, you know anything. generally um well i'm i've got a new book coming out in uh three or four weeks time called illustrators sketchbooks That's with fantastic. thames and hudson uh it's at arm's length uh buy now while stocks last um <laughs> it's a book um uh, Thames and Hudson have done a, a sort of loose series over the years on on sketchbooks. They've done uh, architect sketchbooks, explorers sketchbooks, the the, the sea journals, um, and I find the the process behind the work almost more more fascinating than than the outcomes themselves. So 
I've selected 50 or 60 illustrators from the past and present, uh, you know, very Thomas Buick, Edward Gorey, Edward Ardazzoni, people like that, right through to contemporary illustrators, a mixture of well-known and emerging. And each I've written a piece about each of them, asking them their thoughts about why and how they use sketchbooks. Some use mostly for observational drawing, some uh, for planning, for structure, for storyboarding, everything, you know, shopping lists, sticking things in. So it's been a joy to work on. Um, and I'm supposed to be starting a new project with um, Thames and Hudson in the coming weeks. Um, a in their series the illustrator that the illustrators rather that um they produce which is again wonderfully shining spotlight on past and present illustrators but i can't tell you who it is i'm i'm writing about of course um other than that i mean i still draw um but really very much now i mean not to commission uh, drawing and printmaking it still feeds what i do but um I think because the previous book um, was also about drawing, drawing for illustration. Um, if you had asked me what my research interests are in, in university terms, as they call it now, research, I call, I I call it I call it writing about stuff I like. Um, okay. Yeah. But yeah, I just got more and more interested in in drawing and uh, how it relates to illustration and, and what its role is, um, because again. It, as I say, it's something that has been sidelined. And for students with so many potential tricks and um, digital apparent solutions at their fingertips, it's harder and hard, harder to get them to think, you know, drawing is, is like meditation, you know, it, it's just so far removed from learning uh, on screen. So, but Fortunately, our students do seem to dive in wholeheartedly once we get them through the early fear. Yeah. yeah. So if you had a magic wand, what would you do for your education? What, would you change something? Oh, right. Now you're talking. Is there a simple magic wand? I think, I suppose it's everything I, I've been saying about the, the way that uh, the, the nature of education in art and design is so fundamentally different uh, as compared to the way learning is quantified in, in universities now, you know, that everything is broken down into boxes. You've learned this, you've done this module, um, you've ticked that box and, you know, it, Modularity works for most things. For, for art and design, you know, I would have one giant module called um, the illustration course, yeah. <laughs> which uh, people, you know, people learn in different ways. They they learn through making, which you can't you can't quantify in quite the same way. Um, over the years, you know, we've been doing so many performing so many gymnastics to fit within this kind of measuring of learning i've always found that the students who who do best are the ones who are least interested in what marks they get um i know i know there was a lot wrong with uh, art schools uh when we go back to the 60s and 70s i mean you know tutors were makers they were leading makers and and that was great but some of them we're not necessarily good teachers. Um, but now I think we've gone so far the other way that uh, to, to become a, uh, a teacher or an academic, as you have to be now, um, you know, you have to do teacher training, you have to do a PhD. And I'm supervising several PhD students. And I chose to supervise PhD students in illustration because I was really terrified that the universities were going to be employing staff who were theorists rather than practitioners um so i developed um phd by practice in illustration and i've supervised i think 15 to uh full phd level and uh several of them are course leaders around other art schools now 
some are much still working mainly on their own practice um, but they're all working within the field of illustration in one way or another mm. um, and that's really great to see but their PhDs are very much rooted I only accept candidates who have a very strong personal practice and a record of employment in illustration uh, or mostly, I mean, or, or, you know, very good um, master's level practice. Because it's a kind of knowing that comes through making um, yeah. that is just essential to the, yeah. the teaching. Absolutely. I could pontificate all day about this left, <laughs> left heiress, but um, I, I get the sense that, that a lot of other course leaders around the country feel the same way, which I guess for you is, is part of, you know, why you're doing this. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm not supposed to ask you questions. Oh, no. <laughs> so how can our viewers and listeners find you? Via my post, um, my email address is, is mm. easy to find via mm. Anglia Ruskin University. I'm now um, belatedly on Instagram, having avoided social media all my life, but my um, publishers insisted you've got to be on Instagram to sell books. Um, now I'm addicted, um, but I am at um, at Prof Martin Salisbury. Okay, um, and I mostly post um, again just stuff I like. A lot of mid-century illustration, and occasionally some of my own drawings. Um, um, yeah, anything visual. Wonderful. And what advice would you like to leave us with? Well. I'd like to leave you with the advice of keep up the good work. Um, really enjoyed this. And I just think it's important advice to young illustrators. I think just don't look for quick solutions. Just draw, draw, draw. I mean, go out and draw the world around you. I think it's this kind of looking is so hard growing up in this uh, age of social media. Um, digital manipulation creating images that look look good superficially um but drawing is the only thing that will help you to really know and understand the visual work and to be able to judge others work uh, to perceive the visual word world fully um so try try to resist the temptation and get out with your sketchbook fantastic well thank you so much my it's been pleasure. a real pleasure. Uh, we'll keep, of course, the communication open. There is the Design Education Forum uh, next year, September 24th. So we'll talk about that. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.